Good evening. I'm Pastor Denny Stahl. I'm the senior pastor at Calvary Chapel, Grants Pass, Oregon. And we're now starting our statewide broadcast all across Oregon. Homes and home groups, churches tuning in via the uh, online capacities that we have in this di digital generation to truly join us as we introduce our part of I Pledge Sunday 2014, The Rise of the Church. And we have a very informative program for you, and we want to begin by truly turning our attention to uh, our Maker and to invite Him to truly allow uh, the Holy Spirit to guide our hour. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we're so grateful and so glad that we live in the great state of Oregon. Lord, we're grateful for our spiritual heritage here. And Lord, we're grateful to be citizens, Lord, of the United States of America. Lord, we're so grateful that Christians are dual citizens, citizens of heaven and citizens on earth. And Lord, we know that you have a plan for us. We simply dedicate ourselves this evening to learning how we as individuals, as home groups, as churches, as pastors can truly begin to do what our national broadcast has invited us to do, to pray and to seek you first. But then, Lord, like Dave Barton shared with us, to do something. Lord, I, I talk to people all the time who are a little tired of all the discussion, all the talk about the problems in our cities, in our counties, in our state, and in the United States, in the world. And Lord, people are really crying out for an opportunity to do something. And Lord, I pray that we would become a people of prayer, that individually and corporately we would lift up your name on high, and that we would seek you first. And Lord, as we seek you, we pray that you would give us winsome strategies. Lord, wisdom from on high, like your servant James said, if any lack wisdom, all we need to do is ask. And so, Lord, we're asking for the wisdom to know what to do, like the mighty sons of Issachar in King David's army, who understood the times and knew what Israel ought to do, Lord, help us to be people who understand the times and what citizens in Oregon ought to do. I'd like to start this evening as we uh, introduce you to a man that perhaps some of you uh, will recognize. Uh, he is a former retired state senator, a farmer uh, in the uh, uh, northern part of Oregon, a man that Vicki and I have known for years. And he, as a godly voice, uh, in the state house when he was in Salem, and he has truly uh, championed uh, what we would describe as real civic activism, not in a way that is offensive, but in a way that is winsome. So Steve, would you uh, share this uh, short little interview that Senator Charles Starr uh, recently recorded for us? Well, I'm here with uh, Charles Starr, and Probably one of the greatest things I've heard said about you was that uh, here was a man that jumped into politics and kept his character all the way through. So former senator, legislator, man of integrity, lover of God. And before really a Republican, you actually are somebody who really cares about and loves this nation. And so I appreciate that. Great husband, raised great kids. So you have concerns. This is an important election coming up. and. Uh... You know, in the beginning, our founders declared independence from Britain. They said that we were granted by our, our creator unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that the government is instituted among men to protect those rights. That in the beginning, our nation was a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And so, as the people, we're responsible for the kind of government we have. And that puts a burden on my heart, that we might prefer for those we elect men of moral integrity, men who will stand up and not deviate from the character that has been developed in their lives. And so, as responsible civic citizens, we Christians should be the most knowledgeable and the most active supporters of the elective system. We should be at the polls and casting our ballots. And this is something that hasn't happened for some time. 
In the last presidential election, there was 25 million evangelicals that didn't cast a vote. In the state of Oregon, 300,000 evangelicals in the state of Oregon didn't cast a vote in the last presidential election. That's a big voting block, and we have an opportunity as responsible citizens to affect our culture by who we prefer to lead us. I think that we need to be responsible. We need to be registered. We need to be informed, and we need to be voting. This is something that is heavy on my heart and has been something that I've worked toward for many years. And with God's help, I'll continue. We want to see God glorified and honored in our community, in our state, and our nation. I think you've done this. Now, we have an election coming up. Do you think this coming election is particularly significant, and why? It is a very significant election because we have a president who is, by executive order, has denigrated or looked down upon the legislative body, which is supposed to make our laws. And so if we could possibly gain a majority in the United States Senate, then we could effectively block his use of executive orders to change the direction America is going. This would be terribly important, and I'm praying that God would intervene and that we might see some stability come back to our federal government. So if there's any, maybe one or two things you would say to voters that they must do in this next election, what would it be? They must be registered before time runs out here in the middle of October. When they receive their ballots, they need to prayerfully consider the choices they must make, and they must return those ballots so that they are observing the function, which is important, and that is casting a ballot so that we, the people, continue to control who governs us. Well, it's a shame more evangelicals have not voted, so hopefully that will be turned around in this next election. Any parting thoughts, then? You've said it all, Pastor. I appreciate it. Okay, you did a good job. Thanks, Charles. Thank you. Senator Charles Starr, we're so grateful for Senator Charles Starr, and we thank him for his time. Um, One of the things that oftentimes I, I, I hear from people is, well, I've just got one vote. What can one vote do? And truly, you perhaps have uh, thought that your voice doesn't really matter, that your voice doesn't really count. Living in Oregon, where, quite frankly, the population centers are certainly uh, in the major metropolitan areas, the cities of Oregon, oftentimes at the local level in small counties like Josephine or Jackson County, Deschutes County, uh, we have a tendency to believe that our vote really can't make a difference. I had the privilege of being at Parkway Christian Center for a Church of the Valley uh, pastor's meeting when a man shared with us a little different perspective about how important individual votes and votes in rural areas in Oregon can truly make a difference. And so uh, I've invited our dear friend, uh, Art Harvey, who uh, for many years has worked at the county courthouse in the county clerk's office and as an elected position has been our county clerk here in Josephine County for the past six years. Would you please help me welcome Art Harvey. Thank you very much. Good evening to all of you. Um, I'd like to say I'm very happy to be here, and I'd like to thank Pastor Stahl and the organizers to allow me to come here and speak to you all about something that is very important, and that is voter registration and participation. I give presentations like this to all sorts of groups, um, high school groups, middle school groups, service clubs, uh, political groups of just about every stripe. My goal here tonight isn't to advocate for or against any particular candidate or position. My goal here tonight is very simple, and that is to show you just how your vote matters, even coming from a small community like this. So let's begin. 
Uh, I th first, we're going to talk about the population of Oregon. As you can see, there's just a, a little bit less than 4 million people who live in Oregon. Of those 4 million, about 3 quarters or 3 million are eligible to register to vote. But then, of the 3 million, only approximately 2 million actually take the time. So about two-thirds of the people in this state that are eligible to cast a ballot take the time to register. The, other, the others do not. Now here's a snapshot of the uh, registration in Oregon. If you're registered a Democrat, you probably like those numbers. If you're registered a Republican, you probably don't. But that's, the, that's what Oregon looks like um, right now as far as party, party registration. Now let's look at the largest county with regard to voter registration in Oregon, and that's Multnomah County. Multnomah County makes up about 21% of the electorate here in the state of Oregon. If you put Multnomah, Clackamas and Washington County together, it's almost half of the state as far as registered voters. It's about 45 percent. Now let's look at little old Josephine County. Looks pretty small, doesn't it? Josephine County has approximately 2.3 percent of the voters in the state of Oregon. That's it. 2.3%. But remember that percentage for just a few minutes. I'm going to come back to this, and you're going to see how a small amount of voters can make a huge difference in an election. So now let's talk about participation, voter participation. As you all know, Oregon is a vote-by-mail state. Now, I don't think you can make it a whole lot easier than vote-by-mail we, we deliver everything you need to your home or your post office box. All you've got to do is fill in what you'd like to vote for, seal it up, sign it, and get it back to us. But even as easy as it is, the average election in Oregon averages about 50% turnout. It's only about half of the folks registered. Now here's a breakdown. A primary election that's held in even-numbered years in May, 40 to 45 percent turnout typically. A general election, 62 to 85, 85 being a presidential year, 62 being a gubernatorial year. And then county special elections, that's where the turnout really takes a nosedive. That's where we elect our school boards, utility district boards, fire district boards. It's down to 20 to 30 percent. Now these are the averages. There's always exceptions. If you have a property tax measure on the ballot, a contentious race or a contentious issue, that always drives turnout up. But that's, these are the averages. Overall, about 50 percent. So if you think back to the registration numbers, about, you lose about a million people who don't register and then you lose another million who, don't who have registered, but they don't bother to vote. So you've got approximately, in the average election, one million people making the decision for the entire three million that had the opportunity. Now, obviously, because I'm in the job I'm in, I talk to people about that. And the most common reason I hear from people is actually what Pastor Stahl referred to, is they just don't think their vote will make a difference. They say things like, uh, I'm only one person, one vote won't, won't matter. So what I'd like to do is show you a few examples of where a few votes made a very big difference. November general election, 2000, commissioner's race here in Josephine County. Over 37,000 votes cast for that position, and the difference between the winner and loser was 88 votes. November general election in 2004, 
fire district levy. Now this was a small district, 299 votes were cast. The difference between yes and no was one vote. And then more recently, November of 2012, a commissioner's race again here in Josephine County. Over 34,000 votes cast. The difference between the winner and the loser was 58 votes. Now those are just some local examples. There's more, but those are just a few local examples. Now let's take a look at a statewide race. Many of you may remember this. This was in the primary election in 2010. It was the, the office was superintendent of public instruction. As you can see from the slide, Turnout for the, it was a primary election. Turnout was about what the state average is for a primary, around 42%. You can also see that it was a very close election. Statewide, just over 2,500 votes separated the two candidates. Now let's take a little closer look at those results. Ron Maurer was, a, was very well known here in Southern Oregon. He owned a business in the Rogue Valley. He served as a state representative for District 3 for some time. So Mr. Maurer did very well on election day here in Josephine County and Jackson County. In Josephine County, in fact, he got 71% of the votes cast for that race. 59% in Jackson County. But you'll also see down at the bottom of the slide, the turnout. 43% here in Josephine County. That's a little bit better than the state average, but still not great. And 37% turnout in Jackson County. Now notice this next slide. That same race using the certified numbers, if Josephine County had, and Jackson County had turned out at just 50%, just half of the people had bothered to vote, that race flip-flops. Ron Maurer wins that race. And if you look at the next slide, if Josephine County hits 55% turnout and Jackson stays at 37, again, that race turns and Ron Maurer wins that race. Now, I'm not here saying Ron Maurer should have won and, and uh, he was a better candidate. That's not my point. My point is that right here in Josephine County, only 2.3% of the voters statewide, if they had turned out at 55% in that election, they would, have, they would have changed the result of a statewide election with 55% turnout. If you can do that with 55% turnout, what can you do with 65 or 75 or higher? That is the point I'm here to make tonight. That is the power of your vote. So, are you registered? I'm sure most of you here are, but there may be some out there that are watching that are not. There is still time to register for the upcoming general election. The cutoff is this Tuesday, October 14th. If you're not sure if you're elected, a real easy way to find out is to go to the website on the slide. It's www.oregonvotes.org. Or if you prefer, you can call your county clerk. And on that slide is the phone number for every clerk's office in the state. So in closing, I'd like to encourage all of you to participate in the elections process. Exercising your right to vote is a very simple and very effective of making your voice heard in your local community, in your state, and in your nation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Art Harvey. Isn't that eye-opening? Isn't that encouraging to realize that just a few can truly change the way things turn out? 
Uh, I, I certainly appreciate your research and, and Art, I appreciate that perspective. Oftentimes, uh, we just don't think we matter very much, but those statistics and that data truly should convince us all how important it is, not only that we vote, but that we encourage our circle of influence to vote. You know, churches all across this nation uh, have efforts to do exactly that. In fact, uh, Project 75, which is uh, uh, an organization that did some studies concerning evangelical Christians and elections and votes, determined in their nationwide research that when a church holds regular voter registration drives, that on average, only 49% of the eligible voters in that congregation actually register to vote. Now I find that shocking, quite frankly, when a pastor from the pulpit and when a congregation is encouraging the Christians in that church to not only register to vote, but then to exercise the privilege that we have as Americans to vote uh, seems just absolutely ridiculous to me. But here's the deal. In Oregon, unlike other states, we vote by mail, like uh, our county clerk, Art Harvey, reminded us. Uh, we get voter pamphlets in the mail, we get our ballots in the mail, and we can simply return those ballots by mail or drop them off at one of the official ballot boxes located conveniently for us. But as I was looking at this research and I was thinking, you know, um, we always hold voter registration drives at our church. I thought to myself, my goodness, we have an opportunity in Oregon to go just a little step farther than truly just making sure that we encourage Christians and we encourage people to register to vote. And so it occurred to me that truly one of the things we might want to consider is to give uh, the members of our congregation, an opportunity to be held accountable to their vote. And so we held, before the primary election in 2014, we held our very first at Calvary Chapel, Bring Your Own Ballot, Vote Your Values Sunday. Uh, we distributed a, a poster to our congregation and encouraged them to vote in the privacy of their own home, to sign the secrecy envelope, and then on the Sunday before the primary election, bring their completed ballot to church. And we asked uh, our, our county clerk, uh, Art Harvey, uh, how it would be proper to collect those ballots. And we discovered that you can ha provide a ballot box in the lobby of your church, but you simply have to label that as an unofficial ballot box. So people aren't confused about placing their ballot uh, in a box. So on that Sunday, May 18th, 2014, we took a little picture at our first service and uh, gave the folks an opportunity to lift up their ballots and to be uh, held accountable to voicing their vote. Uh, it was an extraordinary experience, in my opinion. Uh, you notice that not everyone who's in that photograph, I'm just trying to be transparent here, trying to be honest, actually brought their ballot to church and, and, and showed publicly that indeed they had privately expressed their own values. We didn't tell people who to vote for or what to vote for. We simply wanted to hold them accountable to vote. And uh, several of the people that didn't bring their ballots uh, confided in me, uh, Pastor Denny, we've already mailed in our ballot. And I hope that that was true. <laughs> I can't guarantee that it was, but we hope that indeed it was true. But we're trying to start a movement here in Oregon. And so uh, we then took our little ballot box to the county court courthouse, and I had the opportunity to visit your very busy office, by the way, on that Monday, Art, and uh, hand over uh, the full uh, unofficial ballot box that we had collected on our two Sunday morning services and deliver them to be counted. Now, I simply have a, a vision uh, to encourage churches, pastors all across the great state of Oregon to join us as we will participate on Sunday, November 2nd in the general election holding our Bring Your Own Ballot, Vote Your Values Sunday. 
Now, I want to kind of issue a personal challenge to pastors. I believe this is an ideal opportunity not to tell people how to vote or who to vote for, what issues to vote. Certainly, I would believe that as you're preaching and as you're teaching, you're instilling those wonderful biblical principles that will build the character and the value in your individuals and in your congregation to vote very properly and very uh, wonderfully for the right candidates and on the right side of issues. And that's, of course, God's side of those issues. And so I hope, as we've now mailed over 300 uh, letters and appeals to pastors all across the state of Oregon, that you will define and set a date for your Bring Your Own Ballot, Vote Your Values Sunday. Wouldn't it be wonderful, Art, if indeed that little initiative, that little movement, would create a more, uh, uh, greater voter turnout? You showed us the difference in just a small county like Josephine County and Jackson County, how that could truly be uh, the thing that tips the, the, the scales in favor of a particular issue or a particular candidate. Because I would imagine that uh, the, the votes that you were talking about in the, in the Oregon superintendent race could have been any issue or any candidacy, correct? And so I, I hope you're encouraged by the fact that we are not simply saying, hey, you know, you've got to vote, you have to vote. We just want to hold you accountable to exercise your right and vote. So remember, bring your own ballot, vote your values Sunday. Hope you'll join us and uh, really uh, make a difference in this general election. And wouldn't it be wonderful this gain momentum and over time, truly the churches in this great state of Oregon uh, exceeded the typical turnout in any election. Because think if there were 20 churches in a community and because of Bring Your Own Ballot, Vote Your Values Sunday, suddenly there was 80, 90 percent turnout in that congregation. It would affect the county, the community, and the state election, I think, in profound ways. You can learn more at our website, Calvary Chapel, uh, Calvary, excuse me, GP.com. We have information, and uh, you can certainly look in to the possibility of joining us uh, with your very own Bring Your Own Ballot, Vote Your Values Sunday. I want to introduce you to a friend of mine, a man who uh, has served this great state of ours in the State House of Representatives. Uh, his family, he and Amy, uh, his beautiful bride and their children live in Bend, Oregon. And uh, when I was pastoring there, I had the opportunity to meet Jason and to really discover uh, how really uh, wonderful a champion he is of godly principles, not only in his own house, but in his community and in the state house. He's a Harvard graduate. He has served uh, in this term six years and is currently serving in the State House of Representatives. Please help me welcome Jason Conger. Well, thank you. Denny is a, a tough act to follow, and uh, so is Art. So I, I had prepared to give you some statistics with numbers, you know, to show that your vote counts. And I'm afraid I'm going to have to scrap that and start over from scratch. Uh, the only thing that I will add, uh, just to, to point out, to elaborate on what, uh, what Art said, is that your vote counts not only in the context of local, uh, local races here, uh, and statewide races, it counts in your state legislative races. And for an example, I'd point you to 2010 when the uh, control of the Oregon State Senate hinged on about 200 votes in Jackson County. And that was what determined, that, that few votes determined who controlled the Oregon Senate. Um, I also remind you, how could anyone forget the year 2000 when um, uh, the uh, who would lead the free world, George Bush or Al Gore, was determined by a couple of counties none of us had ever heard of in Florida, and really came down to a definition of uh, uh, what's a dangling Chad, right? So these things, 
matter because it's important to know your vote count. So I was crazy enough to run for the Oregon legislature uh, against an incumbent in a district that statistically was very, very difficult to win. Um, and, I, and it's a, a, a liberal district by registration. Um, and I was crazy enough to run as a candidate who was open about my values, my family, um, the fact that I'm pro-life. And lo and behold, we won overwhelmingly in 2010. And I was reelected, much to my surprise, in 2012, uh, even more overwhelmingly. So uh, the message that I want to send there is just that, look, we, we think, because sometimes there's a lot of, uh, of pushback on our values, that other people may not share them. Uh, and so maybe we're afraid to be offensive and put them out there. But the fact of the matter is, uh, if, if you come from a position of faith and a, uh, from a, a perspective of love and respect for other people, lo and behold, most people share your values. So don't be afraid. Um, when I ran for U.S. Senate in the primary, I went all over the state. And it's a big state. For those of you who haven't driven around it several times, I don't recommend it. <laughs> especially not if you have a gas guzzler like I do. Um, but it was an amazing experience. And one of the things that I observed all over the state was that people, uh, when I asked them, you know, what, what do you think about the political process? What's going on? Well, you know, I know my vote doesn't count. We already heard about that. But they elaborated and they went on to say, it's not just that my vote doesn't count, it's that no matter who I elect, it doesn't change the outcome, right? Did anybody ever feel like that? You vote for a Republican, doesn't matter. You vote for a Democrat, same thing. Well, I understand the sense of frustration. I, sh I sympathize very much. Um, but I want to point out some things and suggest to you that the reality is a little bit more nuanced than that point of view. So. <clears throat> I, I got to pause because I forgot in the beginning. I brought this up with me because I want to give a shameless plug for the Oregon Family Council. This is a free voter's guide. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if you, want, if you want copies of their free voter's guide, uh, they're out in front of the, the meeting room here tonight, and they're, they're available if you want to take them to your church and just let people pick them up if they want to see them. Um, <clears throat> quickly, because I know I'm going to run out of time here. Um, so, <laughs> back to my point, which was the truth is more nuanced. The fact of the matter is it does matter who you elect to represent you. It makes a fundamental difference, even though sometimes we're not even aware of it. And I will give you one of probably hundreds of examples that I could come up with from my experience in the legislature. In 2013, a bill was introduced. It was 70 plus pages long. And the bill was about vital records. You know what vital records are, right? Your birth certificate, your death certificate. I mean, it's really, really mundane, and it was long and tedious, and it was based on a model bill, a model amendment for vital records that was uh, being adopted around the country. And so it sailed through. There was no opposition. There was nobody speaking in support of it. It was just a technical amendment to our laws. It sailed through the Oregon House, where? I serve. And fortunately, somebody woke up and looked at it and thought about it in the Oregon Senate before it passed the Senate. And uh, do you recall uh, a year and a half, two, well, probably two, almost two years ago now, uh, there was an abortion doctor. I'm going to talk about abortion because it's one of the issues that is related to our values. No matter where you end up on the, the spectrum of uh, of abortion, pro-choice, doesn't matter to me. Stick with me for this for a second. So picking on that one issue and that one bill, it passed the Oregon House. Somebody in the Senate took a look at it, who happened to be pro-life, and saw that it was changing the definition of birth for purposes of your birth certificate. And you know what the change was? It added things like it's not necessarily alive if it moves or breathes, or makes noises. I kid you not. It was buried in a 70-page bill of tedious, vital record stuff. But 
Fortunately, this came on the heels of, you remember the abortionist in North, what was it, North Carolina, Gosnell, right, who was give, having patients giving birth to live babies and then killing them in a very gruesome way. And he's in jail for murder, I believe now. Um, but this would have changed the law in a way that would have brought into doubt whether or not he had killed a living human being. This is serious business. And the only reason that that bill stopped, the only reason that it is not the law of Oregon today is because there were pro-life legislators, there were legislators who share our values, who looked at it and thought, this can't be right. So we were able to stop it. I wanna just leave you with some encouragement here. Uh, in, in the legislative process, it's biased towards inaction. And thank God our founders were thinking ahead and they, you know, as frustrating as it may be, they made our legislative process slow and difficult. And that's because it gives, it gives a chance for people to catch stuff like that and to stop it, even if they're in the minority. I also don't want to leave you with the impression that we're not in the minority in the Oregon legislature. We are. But that wouldn't be true if a few more people voted in every county who shared our values. Um, I got to give you a couple of pieces of scriptural support because I know my audience and, uh, you know, you can't, can't leave the, the podium without some scriptural support. Um, otherwise, you'd think it was just my opinion. Not so. Also, because I'm a Republican, I know that everybody automatically assumes that the first thing I'm going to do is cite uh, Ecclesiastes 10. Anybody know what that is? Yeah, somebody knows. Uh, a wise man's heart inclines him to the right, but a fool's to the left. But I'm not, I'm not going to quote Ecclesiastes 10. I'm going to tell you from Isaiah 9:16, those who guide this people have been leading them astray. And those who are guided by them are swallowed up. My point about the difference it makes in the legislature is that it really does make a difference. And the Bible supports that view because... In the Bible, you can find many examples where the leaders of the people were leading them astray. And even if we don't uh, subscribe to a partisan point of view, even if, no matter what you think, if you believe in God, you have faith, you certainly have to have some level of commitment to your fellow man to make sure that they are not led astray and led away from that faith. Um, and, and this is a way that you can do that. You get a voice in your vote. Uh, surely, we owe our neighbors that, that level of, of devotion. And I've heard repeatedly from people uh, around the state, including pastors, that look, the spiritual and the physical, the temporal are separate. Uh, the separation of church and state, et cetera, et cetera. It's not a matter of imposing a religious view on other people. It's a matter of having that faith, having that belief, and it coloring your worldview and how you approach every secular temporal issue on the planet. It's a set of morals. And if you think that people who don't share your values don't have their own set of values that they're operating from, then, then you're wrong. You're just operating from an illusion. Um, and the last thing I'll do, uh, again, by way of encouragement, is to cite another scripture, which is Proverbs 25. Um, like a muddied spring or a polluted fountain is a righteous man who gives way before the wicked. You, if any of you, and I hope there's some people in this room who will feel called to run for office. I know there's actually someone in this room who is running for office. Um, He's replacing someone on, uh, in the legislature who was instrumental in stopping that bill that I mentioned earlier. It is hard, it involves sacrifice, uh, it, there's name calling, you know, it's like being in the playground in school again. But you know what? The words honor and privilege don't do it justice. It has, it, it has been one of the greatest experiences in my life and it has been an honor and a privilege to serve my neighbors and to be able to be involved in these votes and these conversations. So I want to encourage you, those of you who, who might feel called to, to run for public office in any capacity, to do it. Stand up and do it. And don't be afraid. And for those of you who don't even 
want to contemplate running for political office, number one, you pass the IQ test, unlike those of us who did run, um, or who will in the future. Uh, and, um, but don't think for a second that your voice is not expressed through your vote. Don't think for a second that it doesn't matter and don't be afraid to stand up for what you believe, to speak the truth, and don't, please, don't be fooled. Your vote counts, just as Art said, your vote counts whether you cast it or not. You decide how you want it to count. I appreciate all of you being here. I know it's been an incredibly, uh, almost overwhelming presentation. I was really inspired by it, but I'm more inspired by the fact that you're all here. This is, a, this is a great community. It's a source of strength and encouragement for those of us who run for office and need to, to come to a place like this and see people who care. Go out and find others and, and bring them to the next meeting and do this one, two, three uh, vote and, and take the pledge uh, and get others who are like-minded with you to vote as well. Thank you. Well said, my friend. I appreciate the fact that uh, you are here tonight and those who are watching online. I wanted to announce to you that we're also archiving not only the uh, national feed that came from uh, Family Research Council's headquarters in Washington, D.C., but we're recording this evening the Oregon portion so that it'll be accessible to those who perhaps didn't have the opportunity to see it live, but really need to see it and to understand the encouragement that this evening can bring to people who quite frankly, like the book of Proverbs says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. I don't know about you, but I've, I've noticed this kind of sense of frustration, uh, this, this sense of discouragement uh, among uh, godly people in, in our state who, who feel like almost throwing in the towel, giving up, quitting uh, in, in this spiritual battle because that's truly what we're engaged in. The agency through which we engage ourselves, of course, in elections is our vote. And I so appreciated, Jason, what you had to say, that our vote counts whether you cast it or not. Isn't that an interesting? We have a tendency to dismiss our lack of participation in this process, but actually that is participation in the process, is it not? We're simply choosing uh, not to exercise our God-given right. It was Mark Twain in 1905 who said that truly uh, he would grant the fact that a Christian's first obligation is their duty to God. But after that, that truly our conduct in this world in which we live is brighter than we can imagine. That truly, if the Christian would vote their conscience and vote a clean ticket, that truly that majority would carry each and every election. We've grown discouraged from that perspective and uh, have believed that our vote doesn't matter, it doesn't count, and I, I'm so appreciative of the fact that, that Art's presentation cut right through that thought right through that imagination. You know, Paul, the apostle, said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're mighty to the pulling down of strongholds and the casting aside of every argument that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. I think in the Christian community, we oftentimes have these paradigms of values. We have paradigms of thoughts that need to be taken captive and exposed to the light. Your vote matters. You have a voice, and now it's incumbent upon us to exercise the right to speak and vote our values. I would encourage all of us to realize that we're a small group in this church and perhaps a small audience across the great state of Oregon. But I love what Jonathan told his armor bearer when he was about to challenge the Philistines. He said, you know, it's not... Uh, anything to God, whether he saves by the many or by the few. And so I would encourage you who 
even if you're already registered, that you would kind of make a list of your circle of friends, business associates, co-workers, classmates, whatever the case may be, and think, I'm going to take a little inventory of my own circle of influence. I'm going to find out who's registered to vote and who's not. And, and this is not just for this election, but for every election from this point on. And would you do this? Would you pledge tonight to find two on that little inventory list, two people who will be transparent enough to tell you, no, I'm sorry, I'm not yet registered to vote. And would you encourage them to get registered and take that pledge with you and then vote uh, not only on November 4th, 2014, but in every election, every election carries some importance. In fact, I remember I was pastoring in uh, Deschutes County in the city of Bend in 2004, where about 60% of the electorate uh, voted for the Democratic ticket for uh, president and vice president. That same proportion, about 60% of the electorate, voted to amend the Oregon Constitution to define marriage as one man and one woman for life. Isn't that interesting? That in a state that voted for what you could describe as a, as a liberal ticket also had the character and the moral value to say, yes, here in Oregon, marriage should be between one man and one woman. But Actions have consequences. And because we voted that way, uh, but didn't put people in uh, Salem who would uphold the wishes of the people, uh, the legislature uh, first approved domestic uh, partnerships, and then uh, finally uh, we had an attorney general that wouldn't even defend that amendment to the Constitution in the courts of the land. I don't know about you, but I've just about had it up to here. And uh, I don't want to take it anymore. I want to uh, truly see the rise of the church, not in an offensive way, but in a winsome way where we truly engage our culture, where we truly bring a biblical worldview, uh, not to punish people, not to make life miserable, you know, the Bible clearly states that when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. It's when the wicked are in authority that the people mourn. You know, Jesus reduced those Ten Commandments that the lawgiver gave us to just two commandments. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. How unloving is it to God to not stand up for him in any election, in any given situation. To truly say, Lord, I'm exercising not just a civic responsibility, but I'm exercising a divine command. Yes, God's word tells us to exercise proper citizenship. But think with me also. One of the things that Jesus said, yes, we should love God with all our heart, mind, and soul, and strength, but we ought to love our neighbor as our... How loving is it to vote for legislation or to dismiss ourselves from any election in a way that truly uh, doesn't love our neighbor, regardless of whether they're a believer or not, regardless of whether they hold our same political perspectives or our same worldview, we need to realize that exercising our right to vote as it pertains to others, regardless of who they are or what they believe, has to be a loving thing because God commanded us to, to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. As we conclude the Oregon portion of this broadcast, I think it's incumbent on all of us to truly turn our hearts and our minds heavenward and to truly seek the favor of God Most High. God is almighty. He can turn the tide. You know, the Bible says that when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord raises up a standard against him. 
My wife is the Oregon director for Daughters for Zion, the prayer network of Christians United for Israel. And Vicki, would you come and lead us in prayer? Thank you, Denny. It's all of our privileges to serve God and country. And I look out and say, friends, you are anointed by God to do just that and make a difference in these last days. Father, I pray for every person here and every person listening online and across this great country of ours. That, Father, your anointing would be upon them in these last days, Father, to make a difference in our country this I Pledge Sunday to talk to their friends, to encourage them to vote, that yes, yes indeed, that one vote will make a difference. And Father, that they're speaking out, that you're recording these things for our heavenly kingdom's sake, Lord. The righteousness of God in America is still here today. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for the great people of this community. We pray blessing upon this church that allowed us to host this simulcast here. Bless them and bless Church of the Valley. Bless us, Father, with abundance of your grace and your spirit in Jesus' name. Thank you. Thank you, sweetheart. Now, for those of you who are watching online, perhaps the church or the home group that you're watching in uh, doesn't have those voter registration cards like all of our live audience here at River Valley Community Church can help themselves to right out in the lobby as you're dismissed. I hope you'll pick one of those up and one of the voters guides produced by the Oregon Family Council and made available to us free of charge. Uh, thank you, Jason, for uh, holding that up and inviting us to take part. Uh, because quite frankly, we need to vote ed uh, intelligently. We need to be educated about our vote. And what's that website, Art, one more time, so that those who perhaps don't have an opportunity to get a voter uh, uh, registration application in, what's that website again? www.oregonvotes.org www.oregonvotes.org. Remember, the deadline online is midnight Pacific Daylight Time, Tuesday, October 14th. Would you stand with us as we conclude? Father, I'm so grateful and glad for the hospitality extended to us by United in Purpose and uh, the vision that you've given our friends, Tony Perkins, Dave Barton, Rick Scarborough, Jim Garlow, uh, Sandy Rios, and the American Family Association. Lord, thank you for the wonderful, wonderful diversity and unity that we see expressed in United in Purpose. Lord, I thank you for those champions on the national scene that are really calling the church back to activism. Father, I pray in our great state of Oregon and the wonderful spiritual heritage which we have in this state, the first Christian missionaries west of the Rocky Mountains settled in what became our state capital, Salem. The statue of the Reverend Jason Lee, the Bible under his left hand, the petition for statehood in his right hand, a pastor who was engaged in the civic arena. Lord, I pray that you here in Oregon would raise up Jason Lees, that you would raise up men and women in the ministry to truly hold the Bible near and dear and their civic responsibility and privilege in the other hand. And Lord, I pray that you would truly allow us to be uh, those people who take very seriously the privilege and the responsibility of being citizens of heaven, no doubt, but also citizens in this great state of Oregon. Lord, have your way in this state. Lord, we know that there are issues of vital importance, candidates running for office, and I pray that, Lord, you would truly raise up a block of the electorate that will make a difference on November 4th, 2014. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Good night, and thank you for joining us.